uh, offers a particular uh, insight into the issues of sin and confession, particularly in the life of the church. And uh, this is a great gift to the body, and it deserves to be um, made known. He begins with the description in James 5.16, Confess your faults one to another. And like so many of God's uh, scriptural prescriptions that we acknowledge and quote, we simply don't do them. And, and we suffer the loss of what God has given us as a precious way to be freed from a weightedness that we need not bear if we would but do it. But I guess you've noticed by now that every doing is a humiliation. Every obedience is another ascent to the cross, but it always eventuates in another resurrection unto life. So to confess your faults one to another is a prickly thing and uh, a shameful thing and an embarrassing thing and we, we simply don't do it. We pray privately and personally and hope that that will accomplish the same thing as if we actually did the Word of God. But as we'll go on to see from his chapter here this morning, he calls that a kind of false piety that really does not serve the purpose of sin at all. So he says that he who is alone with his sin is utterly alone. Isn't that true? That if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. One of the ways that in which you can have an index of your sin question is what is the issue of your fellowship? Are you a loner? I know how you've explained it. Well, that's just me. I'm temperamentally, that's the way I am. ba lone me that's cop out fellowship is the name of the game koinonia communion community I mean uh, is the heart of what we're about the heart of uh, power and witness those that, uh, is that those that believed were together and great grace was upon them all to be to be detached separated and or isolated or alone is not a statement of your temperament it's a statement of your sin that's what he's saying and that's what I believe. You may not have recognized it as that. But of course the first propensity of sin is to conceal itself as sin. It's not recognized as sin. And we are very apt at forming generalizations and, and uh, ways of excusing ourselves uh, that would allow us to go on in a kind of uh, separation from the saints even when we're in the midst of community. You know, a uh, thin line between a community and a trailer court. And that thin line is what he's now talking about. If we want to protect ourselves, maintain our privacy, keep ourselves from being found out, uh, uh, save ourselves from exposure or revelation of our condition, it, it usually is expressed in a detachment. You can be physically present and not present. Fellowship is a great blessing, but it's more than just the casual chit-chat and sitting alongside each other. It's the deepest engagement of one saint with another in the light. The final breakthrough to true fellowship does not occur because though they have fellowship with one another as believers and as devout people, they do not have fellowship as the undevout as sinners I'll, put, I'll just say that another way except that we have fellowship as sinners we don't have fellowship if we have fellowship as devout it's a false fellowship that's what he's saying if it's a uh, wearing your best religious face and your best foot forward that's not true fellowship true fellowship comes from brothers who acknowledge that they're sinners being saved by grace. And that as more than some kind of an unctuous little quotation, but as a very real and trembling truth. Who, men who know that their iniquity is ever before them. I think that's the sense that he means. Now, I think I need to make this statement. There's something about the Lutheran mentality that does say, well, we're sinners being saved by grace that becomes a kind of a cop-out 
you're always living in a kind of a negativism where you don't expect sonship, you don't expect maturity, you don't expect full redemption. That's not a pleasing attitude to God. There's a way in which you can acknowledge your iniquities are ever before you, but you don't intend that they should ever be before you. But get the point that he's making. Except that if it's a fellowship of the pious and the devout, it's not a true fellowship. Only as the fellowship of sinners is the true fellowship. Because there the mask is off. There the pretense and the sham is put away. There you present yourself to a brother as you in fact are presently before God and, what, and the place to which he has so far redemptively brought you and no more. And he to you. And that's the foundation for true fellowship. The pious fellowship permits no one to be a sinner. We dare not be sinners. Many Christians are unthinkably horrified when a real sinner is suddenly discovered among them. So we remain alone with our sin, living in lies and hypocrisy. The fact is that we are sinners. Now, that doesn't mean we're in adultery or fornication. But the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked, and who can know it? So, uh, it's not so much an act of sin that we're concealing so much as a disposition and a nature and uh, as well as the expressions of it so um, I don't feel enlarged on this question of what constitutes sin but whether it's a blatant and conspicuous sin or of the more daily and average kind one way or the other there's hardly one of us who is not in some sense implicated in sin In fact, the, the Lord says that in First John, that if we say that we have not sinned, we lie. The grace of the gospel, which is so hard for the pious to understand, that it confronts us with the truth and says, you are a sinner, a great desperate sinner. Now, come as the sinner that you are to God who loves you, who wants you as you are. He does not want anything from you, a work, a sacrifice. He wants you alone. My son, give me thine heart. God has come to you to save the sinner. Be glad. This message is liberation for truth. The way I have occasionally said it is that God can only meet us on the condition of truth because he himself is truth. He'll not meet us on the condition of phoniness and pretense. He'll not play the game of sham. He'll, his grace is available copiously and freely but on the condition of truth alone but if we meet him on the condition of pretense and say we have not sinned he, he's not there uh, to express his grace and to bring a redemptive solution and that's why so many Christian lives remain stalemated and fixed at an unhappy level because they do not meet him on the level of truth because they do not meet the saints on the level of truth that cross is a remarkable uh, architectural design a horizontal member a vertical member and the vertical member is no truer than the horizontal if the horizontal relationship between brothers is askew off balance out of kilter phony we, we can sing all the choruses we want and come into a kind of beatific uh, uh, feeling in our vertical relationship with God, but it's no truer than the horizontal. God has fixed it. That cross is permanently put together in such a way that the one member is altogether related to the other. And the vertical is no more straight and no more true than the horizontal. In fact, it would be much safer for us to measure our vertical relationship with God on the basis of the horizontal level. You want to know what your, what your relationship with God is? How is it with men? How is it with your brother? If it's deceitful there, phony there, secretive there, withholding there, unloving there, don't presume to think that the relationship with God is somehow better or separate or other than that. The two are inextricably and inexorably joined together. You can't have 
a more exalted relationship with God while at the same time there's an inferior uh, and indifferent or secondary level with men with, his, with the brethren you know the wonderful uh, legend of the uh, of church history in Scotland that again some of you I'm always taking it, some of you have always heard something I'm saying but I'm going to put all former tapes out of circulation and when I got to Scotland I heard this wonderful story Scotland was a terrible pagan nation in fact its whole history is steeped in violence and blood of warfare between clans even in modern times because of a reversion back to its pre-Christian history but that a great missionary by the name of Columbo came to Scotland from Ireland I don't know in what century and uh, took residence in some island off the Scottish coast and with a community of brethren he came in community and they lived together for two years and at some point probably something like the history of the church at Antioch when something came together in the qualitative kingdom way when the heavenly thing began to click in terms of the truth of their own relationship as it says in Acts 13 and when they were ministering unto the Lord together the Holy Ghost said separate unto me he waited for something in the brethren before the first authentic apostolic sending and that I think was true in this instance of the gospel coming for the first time to this pagan nation and I think that the great uh, the principal pagan people were called Picts P-I-C-T-S and uh, according to the legend they had a double walled fortress and uh, barring any entry from the outsider and Columbo by himself stood in front of this gate that was uh, unpassable and he made the sign of the cross and the moment that he made the sign of the cross the gate opened of itself nothing could deter or block the thrust of God that came to that people who became Christians overnight the entire pagan nation was converted overnight by the, because the whole outreach began in such a powerful supernatural demonstration of God that, that no wall could, could deter but when I heard that story that he had made the sign of the cross I thought now I know why that gate opened because it was not a genuflection of a religious kind but a statement of the authenticity and truth of the life of the man and the people who had joined with him in community when he pointed upward in the making of that sign it was a true relationship because when he went horizontally that relationship was also true and when those things come together in truth the vertical to God and the horizontal to man no gate can stand against it how much of the present power of the church and its outreach and its missions is altogether vitiated or weakened because we have not given sufficient attention to the horizontal member and thought that our own private reverie with God covers everything because it's the horizontal that unmasks us it's the relationship with men that's the true requirement that's where the light uh, walking in the light is where the issue is joined and many of us in a pietistic way in a false piety of, of an imagined relationship with God that somehow is ethereal and holy while the horizontal thing has been neglected or ignored are living in a state of deception and there's no power in their life and no power in the church for the want of it so this issue about uh, recognizing ourselves as sinners before each other is really a message of liberation the mask you wear before men will do you no good before him he wants to see you as you are he wants to be gracious to you isn't that remarkable I just said that hey thanks Dietrich for that in the mouth of two witnesses it is confirmed that God waits to be gracious but he can only be gracious on the basis of his truth he came full of grace and truth and if you don't meet him on the ground of truth you exempt yourself from the benefit of his grace you can dare to be a sinner thank God for that he loves the sinner but he hates sin through him men could be sinners and only so could they be helped all sham is ended in the presence of Christ the misery of the sinner and the mercy of God this was the truth of the gospel in Jesus Christ 
It was in this truth that his church was to live. And uh, only the Lord knows what happened in the upper room in those ten days. But I think what happened was something like this. All of the sham, all of the pretense, all of the religious zeal was unmasked. And the terrible failure of... uh, I remember when Jesus said, um, someone at this table will betray me. Lord, is it I? You know, he who dips into this dish. Well, Judas certainly did. But so did every one of them. Judas' betrayal was shameful, but so was the betrayal of them all. Without exception. Even, even the, 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 the disciple that laid his head on Jesus' breast is supposed to have been the one that had fled nakedly. And they had ten days to ruminate over that, that failure. And I think that uh, God picked the bone of that clean and showed them their, their real condition and need and heart and met them with a grace called the baptism of the Holy Spirit when they emptied themselves of everything that was sinful and false God came in grace to fill them with his own presence which is true and it was in this truth that his church was to live maybe that's what is left unsaid in such great statements as those that believe were together how could they be together except they were in right fellowship And how could they be in right fellowship except that they were walking in the light as he was in the light And I I just suspect that there was a consistent walking in the light and keeping the accounts uh, current and not allowing a build-up of a residue of things that we have not had the courage to express or to deal with to kind of lie back there and finally become forgotten to us but known to God and create a film or a weight through which we, we slug. And it becomes so normative to live at that level that we think that it's, it's right so what is God's provision confess your faults one to another something about um, God giving authority to the church to um, how did he say it uh, whatever you whatever you bind in earth is bound in earth whatever you loose is loose in heaven that there's an authority resident in the church even to forgive and to dismiss sin. If it's freed on earth, it's freed in heaven. If you do it on earth, it's free also in heaven. If you do it on earth. And that's where the confessing of the faults one to another comes in. Because if if it's not at that level, how shall it be freed on the earth that it might be freed also in heaven? Our brother has become Christ for us in the power and authority of the commission Christ has given to him. Our brother stands before us as the sign of the truth and the grace of God. He has been given to us to help us. He hears the confession of our sins in Christ's stead, and he forgives our sins in Christ's name. He keeps the secret of our confession as God keeps it. When I go to my brother to confess, I am going to God. This is a distinctly and profound, profoundly Lutheran view it almost has like a Catholic overtone but instead of going to a father confessor a priest you go to a brother but you go there's a, there's a dynamic that God has set right into the church that's at the heart of church as church as fellowship that keeps it free keeps it clean keeps it flowing keeps it true namely confessing your faults one to another that you might pray one for another that you might be healed So the Christian community, when the call to brotherly confession and forgiveness goes forth, has a call to the great grace, is the call to the great grace of God in the church. It is a great grace to be free from sin, to be absolved, to have the weight and the guilt of it broken and dismissed, (sighs) that you need not shamefully withhold yourself for fear of being detected, and you can really open-facedly come uh, be in relationship with the brethren with nothing to fear nothing to withhold because you've been found out you've confessed it the, you know it's a wonderful freedom and it's a dynamic set right into the heart of the church but unhappily and tragically it is not done 
I'll just raise the question rhetorically. That means you don't need to answer, but just to consider it. When is the last time any of us have confessed a fault or a sin to a brother or a sister, one to another, and asked for that brother's prayer to be released from it? Let's, let's be truthful. And we're not novices. We're, we're not newly inducted into the faith. We're not all, just off the streets as, as a bunch of hippie freaks who just got saved. We're people with histories in God. Some of us are ministers. And yet we are not doing the word of God. That God has, has inserted a provision of such a powerful and re- remarkably liberating kind and we do not do it. And the substitute for it is a kind of pious taking it to the God, to God privately. But as we'll hear from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, it's a moot question whether God hears something that you're giving to him as a subterfuge, as an alternative, because you're unwilling for the shame, which is to say the, the cross experience of going to a brother. The only thing I wanted to say is that we really can't come into that place of confession without that community that we can more of the people that we feel safe. Good. Very good. So the great safety in that if we don't live in a community, we have community with one or two people. Go to the head of the class. Good. Very good. Just take your statement and give it a little uh, twist. Conventional church, as it is presently constituted, does not provide an environment for confessing our faults one to another. <laughs> You, you can't do it with strangers. And church is essentially that if the relationships are casual. We don't know each other well enough to trust each other sufficiently for such an intimate thing as the confession of our faults. In fact, you know who suffers most as a class? Ministers. They dare not ever breathe these things to their own congregations. And therefore, a certain kind of uh, professional ministerial mystique has been developed of God's man of faith and power stands on the platform as somehow being exempt from the kinds of things that trouble us. He's more trouble than we are. He's struggling exactly in the same areas and even more intensely because he's the focal point for the enemy's attack. But to whom shall he turn? Does he dare express anything like this in his congregation? Who can he trust? And so he has to keep it to himself and maintain the facade of having it all together when inwardly he's contradicted and he knows that the enemy knows. And so what do we get when he gets up to speak? But a weak bleat. We don't get that ringing resolution of full conviction because he's not in that place in his life. And that kind of thing has become so commonplace that we just think it normative. Or we think, well, that's the way he preaches. You know, some are more, some men have a better speaking ability than others. It's not the speaking ability at all. It's the issue of sin. It's the issue of compromise at the foundation of the inward life that has not been brought to the light because he's not in a church situation that is conducive for confession and for deliverance. The whole church then becomes a facade, a kind of a play acting. And if that's happening at the deepest levels of the church, namely its leadership and its ministry, what's happening in the church itself? Unbeknownst, it doesn't have to be known to your mind, something happens in the whole atmosphere by which the same kind of duplicity and hiding and deceit takes place. And the whole congregation then is at that level, going on week after week in a kind of a charade while the world is dying everywhere around it. Good. Uh, I, I think we all <coughs> hunger for a revival, but I'm glad of all that means. <coughs> but Lori Hesham, in a little book called The Calvary Road, uh, had this basic thesis about the confession of our, our sins to one another, being the key to revival. And, and, and I know that that's in college, but it's had several spontaneous revivals. The confession of sin has been. That's good. That's true. Every revival is characterized by that. Make a note of that title if you don't have that book. Another must for your library. Calvary Road, Roy 
Hessian, H-E-S-S-I-O-N, that's also available in paperback. Well, he speaks about this, confess your sin to a brother. It doesn't have to be a public thing before all. The brother stands for the congregation. And if it's done effectually, earnestly, and truly with him, the whole con- congregation receives the benefit. I don't think that was a question. Oh. So, with a pastor confessing to another pastor. Yeah. Oh, to another pastor. Does he have to do it that way, or can he oh. with anybody? Well, it's interesting, in modern Germany today, uh, many of the saints have confessors. But you know when I inquire about it, you know what I find now? The pastors who have confessors, the guy lives on the other side of the country. Uh, they're in North Germany, he's somewhere in South Germany. I said, well, how often do you see your confessor? Uh, once or twice a year. I said, no, you need someone immediate and local, right under your nose, who's observing your life daily. So let that be a rule of thumb. See, this is an artifice. This is playing with the concept by using the terminology and having someone distant who serves that function. It's got to be someone with whom you're in daily relationship and uh, who is a a brother. It's not a confession that you want uh, then passed on from rooftops. So it requires a man who can hold your confession and, and bear the pain of it. You know, sometimes to hear another person's confession and the shamefulness of it is no small thing. Uh, how many people have the spiritual and moral stature to hear the confession of another and not come unglued themselves? So if they themselves are wide-eyed, idealistic, or romantic in the wrong sense and looked upon you as a minister as some kind of uh, statement of God's faith and power and then find out that you have clay feet and are crushed by it, they can't bear the weight of your confession. And as Dietrich Bonhoeffer goes on to say, only a man himself who confesses is in the place to receive the confession of another. See how, how the whole issue of maturity and stature comes alive for the whole church. I'm thinking, you gave an example yesterday of how you used to meet together. So there would be the confession one for another, whatever the age of the person not. But within the church situation, there is this falseness of laity and yeah. clergy, whatever the denomination, yeah. um, that the separateness that denies the royal priesthood and, and how we are all priests. Right. And I, I see this more as the problem of the setting of partners of men in pastoral positions right. um, from the rest of the church yeah. which is a person yeah. and, and God abhors that I think that's Nicolaitanism yes. uh, maybe we'll talk about it another time and that of course enforces that separation the clergy is professional the layman is a dum dum who sits there passively God never intended that but a real interaction of vibrancy in fact never professionalism because an elder is apt to teach and, uh, and may have, maybe even have another vocation you know, I don't know that I know that God never intended a professional clergy, let alone that there should be a distinct, distinction by which they guard themselves from their congregations, lest they be found out. Until something so shameful finally erupts that that the, the pastor is out of the ministry or required to flee with his organist or with whomever else he's had his little tryst, and then the congregation is totally shattered. How is it that something was not spotted in its inception? his propensity to flirtation or uh, a certain liberality in affection with the opposite sex or an unhappiness in his own marriage or certain other kinds of telltale signs that should have been addressed by a loving congregation who is with the man and wants to see him helped and healed. And again, I just quoted one of my my oft-repeated statements. The church or the fellowship of God is as much for the healing of of the shepherds as it is for the healing of the sheep. And a fellowship that is that is not a fellowship in which a shepherd can find his healing is certainly not going to be one in which the sheep will find theirs. We are in this together and on one basis only, truth. The church is the ground and pillar of truth. But anyone who loves truth knows this. It's painful before it's glorious. And the reason that we have not re- taken the the benefit of what God has already structured into the church is our cowardice, is our fear, 
is of uh, angst, the German word A-N-G-S-T, the trembling anxiety, that's afraid to take the risk. Wants to play it safe, keep themselves guarded, and then go on from deceit to deceit, and a kind of a hardening takes place, not only for that individual, but especially if that's the pastor, um, the whole congregation will uh, reflect it. In In confession, the breakthrough to true community takes place. What's the difference between New Testament congregations and charismatic congregations and apostolic fellowships is that however much the, the uh, choruses might be enjoyed and however gifted they are musically and however inspiring their speakers, they lack the apostolic distinctive of having at the heart the truth of confessing the false one to another. Let, let the choruses take care of themselves. But see to this, and the choruses will take care of themselves. Remember that I mentioned once before that in Ben Israel we had made that silly compact with God where we said, Lord, don't let our choruses and our worship or praise exceed the quality and the condition of our life. Rather, let it be the statement of it. And our music was totally unimpressive. Off key, if our lives were off key. Because it's so easy through instrumentation and through amplifiers and and, uh, that kind of ability to give an aura of a certain euphoric kind of enjoyment and worship that disguises rather than reflects what the true state of that fellowship is. And will even deceive themselves into thinking that they have a kind and quality relationship with God that in fact does not exist because they do not have it with each other. But I'm just wondering, there, there's got to be a place where, I know there was a time, for example, when I walked into the church and I was leaning down and digging down, and I felt like God actually spoke the words of, of a particular song that we sing into my heart, which was, let God arise and his enemies be scattered. And, uh, and, and the way I felt him speaking it to me was saying, let God arise in my heart and turn the word, even though that's the furthest thing from my mind and feeling in the moment. You're making a mistake. Okay, that's what I'm wondering. Yeah. I'm not speaking against authentic worship. I'm speaking about the sound or the appearance of worship. It could be uh, cracked, it could be off key, and God is blessed out of the socks because it is the hot expression of his people. But let's not professionalize it and musicalize it in the ability which is ours humanly and religiously to disguise something that God wants revealed. He's the God of truth. Uh, so I'm not ag- against the uh, worship. But there is no. A sense of lifting of yeah. Himself up to God, even though uh, the circumstances are yeah. the greatest. Definitely. Okay. But very often the heaviness that we do feel is the result of the thing that's unconfessed, mm-hmm. which has given the enemy opportunity to be oppressive and I would say in every case I know that there are external factors and there's a great drama of conflict between powers of darkness and light and even those fellowships that are in uttermost light will be especially the victim of the oppressive forces of darkness but more often than not a heaviness that's to be felt is I think uh, to be traced to an unconfessed sin you remember in the history of uh, Darmstadt and the um, the um, sisters of Mary, Basilea Schlink, how when they were building their mother's chapel and they had the trolley, they, were, they got the bricks from the, the buildings that were destroyed in World War II, they themselves were putting it up with their own hands and they had a trolley to carry cement and the thing was going off the tracks and they would put it back up on the tracks again and the thing went off the track again and finally they realized the problem was not mechanical but spiritual and on their, their job site they had a prayer tent and they went into the prayer tent and they began to seek the Lord and the Lord showed them there's an unresolved and unexpressed conflict going on between two or more sisters. And the moment that they broke and repented over that and confessed it as sin and resolved the thing that was between them, the thing operated thereafter without a hitch. So uh, 
I would say it's not an exhaustive answer that it's this in every case, but more often than not it is. And I would make it the first line of inquiry. If there's a heaviness, uh, is there something that needs to be brought to light? God is not going to let us go on with a happy service while the reality of our life is in contradiction to himself. Okay. Yeah. Going back a bit, but it's affecting your thing going to another inappropriate thing. Uh, women, women. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think there's a real problem. It's wiser and safer. Although there could be instances, you know, where a mature and older brother or man would, would be the one. I don't know how the pairing takes place. I would say that if we're earnest before God, and we really want to make an authentic confession and not play at it, we would make that amount of prayer, Lord, show me the one in this fellowship to whom I should make this confession. <coughs> it may not be that you're going to the same one on every occasion. Right. Because there may be as much for the one to whom you go as yourself in going. God is testing that one by his willingness to hear you, to bear the weight of your sin, and to know that how can I listen to this sister when I myself have unconfessed sins? How can I be for her what I'm not for myself? She's forcing me to a place of truth that I myself would not have sought. You see what I mean? So all of these things are possibilities that need to be submitted to God in prayer. Hopefully we would come to a place where virtually anyone in the fellowship that is truly a fellowship could be trusted with such confession. But we'll see if he, if he picks that up. But this is not answering every particular and every question. He's speaking broadly about the principle of it. So the confession, in, in confession, the breakthrough the true community takes place. In the darkness of the unexpressed, the fellowship is poisoned in its whole being. Isn't it interesting that uh, there was an episode took place in a fellowship I know where a young man committed fornication with a Christian girl, really seduced her. Her parents were outraged, and the final upshot was that the pastor worked some kind of thing by which he was to leave the, the congregation, go to California, and attend the Bible school. And the girl was patted and made nice. The parents were placated, and we went on. Within, I think, the next year or two, his own teenage daughter became pregnant and subsequently had a second illegitimate pregnancy. And I said I, to him, I said, I wonder if there's any connection between the failure to have identified that first fornication as sin before the entire congregation to learn the exceeding sinfulness of sin rather to have hidden it and to have made a kind of political thing of it and brushed it off because it has come back now to haunt the congregation through your daughter's own shame. God, we're in the last hour. And I think that if God is not, has not been acting this way uh, in prior times, he's not hesitating to act this way now. How do you know when to confess like, to the church? Like you were saying, you would confess to the whole congregation. And when to confess to an individual? I would say that uh, a confession to the whole congregation is appropriate when the sin has been to the congregation or against the congregation. The whole congregation has been affected by that sin but if it's a sin of your own before God unrelated to the congregation so to speak that's the kind of thing you take to a brother personally um, couldn't you also say though that there are situations where even though the sin was of, of a more private nature because it continued for a period of time or whatever it did in fact affect yeah. the ability of that congregation to function and yeah. because of that even though perhaps you've mm -hmm. been taken care of right away and you didn't, you have an obligation now to confess yeah. it publicly. You can never err by uh, over mm -hmm. You know, if you, when in doubt, confess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Rather than withhold. Mm -hmm. uh, wh whenever you face something where there's a, the flesh is either going to be favored or subject to uh, the cross, choose the cross. A good rule of thumb. And uh, it'll help you. This is a, a brother who has failed to acknowledge his sin when he has been confronted 
and then has been confronted again by two or more then is brought before the whole church now that's another that's, that's judging those who are unwilling to acknowledge their sin when the congregation is being affected that's some, another subject for now ok sin must be brought into the light the unexpressed must be openly spoken and acknowledged all that is secret and hidden is made manifest it is a hard struggle until the sin is openly admitted since the confession of sin is made in the presence of a Christian brother the last stronghold of self-justification is abandoned the sinner surrenders he gives up all his evil he gives his heart to God it's remarkable this thing about self-justification I think we were treated to a little expression of it last night among other things but we don't have to look back we can it's with us always there's just that nature in us that wants to make something sound better look better appear better but self-justification is abandoned in true confession there's no attempt to cover it or to disguise it it's painful it's a struggle the sinner surrenders he gives his heart to God by giving his confession to man and he finds the forgiveness of God for his sin in the fellowship of Jesus Christ and his brother the expressed acknowledged sin has lost all its power the enemy has been cheated of his opportunity to compromise to weaken to debilitate to cause depression you know a lot of things that we suffer depression moodiness are symptoms of unconfessed sin of contradictions that are operating in our inner life because we have been unwilling to walk in the light I'm not saying that, that I'm the last personality that is continually whistling Dixie and uh, is always in a great mood. But uh, wherever there is a preponderant uh, melancholy, moodiness, touchiness, depression, this is more than the issue of temperament. It's likely the issue of sin. We don't, we don't have to be all whistling every day and in great moods, but be aware that if there's a propensity toward depression there's something that unreconciled in the life in, in the life of that believer that he need not bear if he had confessed his fault one to another there the fault the sin has lost its power it has been revealed and judged as sin it can no longer tear the fellowship asunder now the fellowship bears the sin of the brother he is no longer alone with his evil for he has cast off his sin in confession and handed it over to God it has been taken away from him now he stands in the fellowship of sinners who live by the grace of God in the cross of Christ Jesus you know why I'm doing this now first rather than review last night first because the review of last night will be profoundly different after we hear this than it would have been had we spoken it before what, what he is getting at is a congregation or a fellowship that lives in the knowledge of itself as sinners saved by the grace of God it's not the fellowship of the pious it's not those who have it all together it's the fellowship of the broken it's the fellowship of the, of the people that know but for the grace of God they go I, I could have been the one speaking last night and I would have exhibited worse things of failure because of perhaps some want in my own life and so on to confess the fault one with another you understand what I'm saying we're all sinners being saved by grace and if, if it was not last night that was our uh, exposure it will be tomorrow and um, Adrian pointed that out in the morning earlier discussion time we need to be identified with the brother who is in sin or who is being examined or whatever it is and not to see ourselves superior or apart that kind of atmosphere and think hard of where you were last or in the fellowship that you presently are whether this is the atmosphere that prevails of sinners saved by grace being saved that brokenness in the entire congregation of people who know that but for the grace of God they go on yeah, Art's got this problem with his marriage but if I were in his shoes uh, would it have been resolved? Do I have a greater handle on, uh, on marital things than he? 
Do I have a wisdom or an ability greater? Or whatever the situation is, this kind of um, attitude and disposition would encourage the kind of confession that is the, a true life of fellowship. Now he can be a sinner and still enjoy the grace of God. He can confess his sins in his very act and in this very act find fellowship for the first time. The sin concealed separated him from the fellowship, made all his apparent fellowship a sham. The sin confessed has helped him to find true fellowship with the brethren in Jesus Christ. Though it's a confession to a single brother, and does not require all the members of the congregation, the fellowship with the entire congregation is restored because I meet the whole congregation in the one brother to whom I confess my sins and who forgives my sins. Isn't that a remarkable statement? <coughs> I meet the whole fellowship, the whole congregation in the one brother to whom I confess my sins and who forgives my sins. In the fellowship I find with this one brother, I have already found fellowship with the whole congregation. In confession occurs the breakthrough to the cross. The root of all sin is pride. Confession in the presence of a brother is the profoundest kind of humiliation. It hurts. It cuts a man down. It is a dreadful blow to pride. To stand there before a brother as sinner is an ignominy that is almost unbearable. In the confession of concrete sins, the old man dies a painful, shameful death before the eyes of the brother. Because this humiliation is so hard, we continually scheme to evade confessing to a brother. This is a remarkable insight that though we have celebrated the cross theoretically and theologically, we've, we've not enjoyed its power because the place where it most has opportunity to bring death to pride, which is to say self, is in confession. In confession of concrete or specific sins, the old man dies. Not only do we have a propensity to rationalize our situation, but we have a propensity to avoid being specific about it. I always notice this. When a word from the Lord comes in a message and then an invitation for people to respond the first level of response is usually of a very general kind. The second level, if it goes on that long, becomes a little bit more specific. And then if there's a real breakthrough, it becomes very specific. The first responses are always general. Very rarely do they speak of themselves, but the prayer is a generalized prayer. And, and this has been so acceptable in our Christian experience because it is really a cross evasion. The cross becomes the cross in the specificity and the concreteness of the sin that is acknowledged. That's where it hurts. That's where the shame is uh, ignited. That's where the cross and the, the splinters, the, the barbs, the, the, the truth of it is registered. So that even in confession we can sidestep the, the reality. We can make a play at it and talk around it and make an allusion to it and still come out with our pride intact when God intends the pride to be crucified in the very act of confession in proportion as it is specific. David? Which, which, and sometimes we can see ourselves on the full release that God wants to bring. And I thought that sometimes there can be a brother that's struggling, and he may have unconsciously offended several people. So if it's a public confession, yeah. then that covers the whole thing, and it's because God creates them, a, a bonding with the yeah. people. But there's so many part of life, so you might get out of six, seven people that are going to be offended, that are going to be there, because it's public. The public will assure the greatest shame and the greatest reality of the cross. But uh, a lot depends privately on who, the, who to whom you're confessing. If he's a soft touch, 
and will be sufficiently impressed by just a general statement of a situation that is not specific, then you've gotten off the hook. But if, there, if he's really a godly man who himself knows the power of release through true confession, he'll not let you get away with that. He'll say, uh, you're not really giving me the whole thing here. You're, you're just kind of beating around the bush or you're speaking very generally. What's the nub of this? What, in fact, is the, is the truth here? You know, let, let's have it. And that's, that's what we need to be to each other. If the same problem exists confessing to your spouse. Uh, spouses tend to let us off the hook far easier than... Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's easy to be insincere, even while we think we're being sincere and that we have discharged our duty. And so the whole issue of the degree that, it, that sincerity is sincerity is the issue of the cross. If you haven't felt the pain of it, if you've not burned, you know, there's a certain kind of burning in that humiliation, you've probably not been truthful. You're still saving something, you're still protecting something, and therefore cheating yourself and the fellowship of the flow of the life of God that will continue to be impeded. The issue is the cross and our willingness to bear only a slight measure of what Jesus bore, and yet we sidestep it, even in the process of seeming to fulfill it. We've got to be ruthlessly truthful about this, or we'll continue to play the game until the day of the Lord's appearing. And when Paul said that you might be found blameless in the day of his appearing, this is what he's talking about. Because when he comes, we shall be standing in ultimate light, and whatever has been concealed in darkness will then be shamefully revealed in an unbelievable pain that will be the compounding of all of the lesser pains that we were seeking to evade will in that moment come upon us in a full weight of such a, 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 a shriek. Imagine having to bear that eternally. So may we be found blameless in the day of the Lord's appearing. And that's not going to be a last moment's homework because... We're expecting him tomorrow, but by a consistent keeping current of every single thing that needs to be faced as freshly and as quickly as the thing itself has taken place, while we yet know it in its full and have not allowed it to uh, dissipate away in convenient forgetfulness. Is that John who had a hand? Okay. Paul? Just wondering, so I a lot about the relationship with confession on the one hand and somebody usually comments about heaven don't we have to put love cover what we do I don't know what I mean the deeper is that I guess I'm realizing somewhat reluctantly that the love to cover the sin sin has to first be covered good so the two require each other as long as not the alternative that was quite a Vulcan statement though yeah. Yeah, I mean, you you have a, a, a flair for feeling for the paradoxes of the faith and aptly expressing them when you're at your best. <laughs> Ralph? <laughs> <laughs> Ralph? No, that's unwise. I mean... To go to God after you've confessed to a brother is certainly a welcome thing. But to go to God in a pious escape from going to your brother is a, is a uh, deceitful thing that does not impress him. And this is what believers most often do. Well, it's like when, it, when the end of a meeting and an invitation is given and you're asked to, uh, to, to make some transaction with God and speak something out. I mean, well, Lord, you know others may be speaking, but you and me, uh, we've got this private thing going and you know what my heart is and I'm just, you know. What it really is, a protection of self. That little privatistic thing that is unwilling to confess and to be heard in the fellowship. But I don't think that God is in that business. He's not accommodating this privatistic thing that wants to save face. So there's the same kind of principle involved. We cannot... Uh, console ourselves to say that that sin has been met because we have confessed it to God if we have not confessed it first to man that's where the real power of it is broken that's where the deliverance from it comes that's where the blood has its opportunity to be applied then you want to speak to God about the same thing 
and that's at the same time being grateful for the provision that he himself has established why would he himself have given this requirement in scripture confess your fault one to another if private confession to him would have sufficed this isn't my uh, um, innovation it's God's biblical prescription because he knows our cop out hearts he knows that we can make a false piety out of this and think that we are absolved of the thing because we've confessed it to him when in fact nothing has been transacted because it's been a sham but going to a brother whom you know and have to face tomorrow and the next day and do the same thing is a much deeper requirement having made that then yes go say, speak to God all you want then he'll hear you but he'll not hear you if the speaking to God is a pious alternative for speaking to a brother yeah well in addition to James 5 16 1 John 9 which we all know uh, if we confess our sins it doesn't say to God he said if we confess our sins in the King James comma he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all of life right and just to make that point it doesn't you know we take it to mean if we personally confess our sins perhaps but it is just it just says if we confess our sins Mm-hmm. the Lord himself um, Bonhoeffer reminds us is our example he became sin he, uh, he suffered and was crucified as an evildoer a scandalous public death in our stead there was nothing private or concealed about his suffering as sin it was public shame and uh, what we are called to do is a much lesser expression of the same but not a total avoidance of the pain of the cross the whole Old Testament thing is picture of that because the man who had sin would have to come with the animal and actually after doing confess the sin that he was bringing the sacrifice for I'm glad you reminded me of that there is that scripture about the exceeding sinfulness of sin and my own observation and uh, personal history as a believer attests to the fact that we don't know it as exceeding sinfulness we don't know the exceeding sinfulness of sin sin somehow has lost its sting it it does not convict us um, as much as if we had seen the animal needing to be sacrificed in order to um, pay for that sin if we had seen an animal squirming and the blood shooting forth at the knife of a priest all of a sudden there would be a pang in our hearts as what sin means what sin what what the propitiation requires would teach us the 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 uh, meaning of sin which is when we get into the subject of the holocaust I'll be saying the same thing the magnitude of the judgment the requirement of the death of the animal is the statement of the enormity of the sin but we don't see that in our practice we're not living under the Hebraic or the Mosaic code we don't see animals being sacrificed we employ a terminology that has become robbed of its power and its meaning we talk about the blood we talk about sin we go through the motions of it but our unhappiness the grayness of our fellowships our moodiness and our depressions our melancholy our lack of real love uh, uh, our quick temper and irritations and all of the other symptoms show we're not living in the reality of the very thing that we profess somewhere we have fallen short somewhere we have taken the provision of God and made it merely phraseological merely verbal we are not doing it in truth there's got to be a pain there's got to be a suffering there's a shame there's humiliation it's a death a death to self in confession um, W.B. Meyer do I have the initials right the English writer There's another one before that. whatever <laughs> on his book on Abraham he's, he writes about Abraham taking Isaac to, the, to Mount Moriah and the moment he heard the word he vowed himself to do it he writes knowing the exceeding sinfulness of sin Abraham took Isaac and made a sacrifice you know, on the mount 
there was something inherent in his Hebraic heart however much he was the father of faith and, and a friend of God that, in, that made this, the, the issue of sacrifice self-evident knowing the exceeding sinfulness of sin he saddled his ass and cut the wood and brought his son as sacrifice the, the, the inherent logic of sacrifice the necessity for a death is somehow related to his consciousness of the evil of sin but it's a consciousness that we modern believers lack some of these places of death that purport to be his house because the wages of sin is death even in the here and now well he talks about Jesus as an example of uh, the death public death of the sinner the cross of Jesus Christ destroys all pride we cannot find the cross of Jesus if we shrink from going to the place where it is to be found namely 
the public death of the sinner. Going to a brother is a public death. In the deep mental and physical pain of humiliation before a brother, which means before God, we experience the cross of Jesus as our rescue and salvation. The old man dies, but it is God who has conquered him. Now we share in the reality of the resurrection of Christ and eternal life. There's a death, but there's a life. So, um, happy for that reminder that it must be a tremendous sense of elation once you've gotten this thing off your heart. It must be such a freedom and such a release, such an ability for the, for the life of God that has been stopped up at that point to begin flowing again and to bless the body. If we are undernourished, emaciated, um, it's because the life of God has not had free course through its members. Remember when Paul says, when you come together, each one has a tongue an interpretation, a psalm, a hymn, a revelation, a prophecy. Paul could leave a a fellowship which he had founded and come back two or three years later, still flourishing, and then appoint the elders. But how is it that they existed so long without him? Because when they came together, each one had a psalm, a tongue, a hymn, a revelation, a prophecy. They were enriched. They were edifying the body by each member giving to the body what the Spirit of God would uniquely express through that member only and not another. And often if a member does not express what God is wanting in that moment, another member is stopped at that point. If if there's flow, there's got to be a free flow and a total flow. But sin is death. Stops the flow. Brings a blockage. Cheats the entire body of the life of God, the wealth of God that would have been theirs had the body been free-flowing. Can you imagine the glory that God is intending? Unto Him be glory in the church. And if there's no glory for Him in the church, there's no glory. It's not to be found or obtained anywhere else. If it will come into the earth, it will come through the church, and then because of the church, finally also later, a restored Israel. The issue of the church in Israel is the issue of His glory. But a church that refuses to be church to be a true community, a true communion of fellowship in truth that is playing its games and masquerades and charades and going through the motions and thinking by its music and quote its worship to disguise what is its true, what is the truth of it? How is that bringing glory? It may provide services. People might be satisfied, but God is not. So, I think that an incentive, maybe the incentive to face the cross, which is what confession is, that the blockages may be removed and the life of God flow unto glory is the issue of His glory. If you'll not do it for yourself, will you do it for His glory? Where you would have been a coward and would have said, I can't, you know, this is too painful for me. But the issue, if the issue is more than you, if the issue is His glory through the church, will you do it? Will you recognize that we're in this together and any member that falters, that withholds, at that point, comes the, the, the blocking of the life and, from, and we just limp on we have not even seen the fullness of God's glory we have not seen the fullness of his power and I think that the Lord is even holding up on the content that he intended for these days because we're not ready for it we can't handle it we have characterological problems we have certain stoppages we have certain unspoken uh, things that are in this little body that keep God from the fullness of uh, light that he would give us on the things that are dear to his heart and to his eternal purpose. We can't handle them. We can't discuss them. We can't appreciate them. We can't hear them. And so he's saying, take care of this first before that. My problem with Reggie was the naivety that we would just immediately enter in to the intensive discussion of the issues of the faith and the mysteries of God. But with the Lord is showing, hey, hold it just a second. There are things here that are surfacing that, that need first to be dealt with. If we are in a particular body that is not willing to go on and have intimacy and to have community, do we stand a chance of defiling ourselves or receiving an illusion by staying here? Great question. Uh, You you want my off the top of the head answer? I would say if that's where God has called you, you stay and you suffer the shame 
the um, loss of life the pain the death that is in that body you bear that suffering and I wonder if that's not what the Lord meant when he talked about the suffering that needs to be filled up for Christ's sake is not the suffering that's going to come from persecution externally so much as what we need first and more so to bear in the body itself the church is a suffering to be identified and to be faithful in such a body that refuses to come to the light that will not see it that continues to disguise it and to play its charades and to be the week after week my God is there any greater pain is there any greater suffering if that's what God has called you but your faithfulness to remain in that place and to intercede for the breakthrough and the breaking of the light may well be the key to the salvation of that work so uh, that's a great question and I'll, I'll bet there's more unsung and unheralded suffering going on in the church worldwide than anyone knows but God of saints who are patiently bearing the terrible condition and strictness of the church and faithfully remain in that place and, and by remaining will fill up a suffering that will bring release yeah? Thirty years of his life, he must have seen them and suffered all that he saw around and heard, and uh, scientists just lived in that. They mentioned it in just the last three years. Mm-hmm. It's a good, good picture. See again how uh, suffering. The word is synonymous with the word cross. If we're unwilling to be cross bearers, then we'll flee to a happier, charismatic congregation where they really have it all together the worship is terrific and the preaching is great and the fellowship of joy and by so doing we will have forfeited something God was wanting in the place of suffering the cross is central to the faith and we are more cross evaders than we know and you know that I bet there's not one Christian in a thousand who changes churches at will who even so much as submits the question to God and thinks that they have an altogether uh, uh, total freedom to pick up and move at will in order that they might be gratified and satisfied in finding another uh, uh, fellowship that more meets their need what about his need I mean where are we when we don't even consider that and don't even submit the question but we ourselves arbitrarily place ourselves where we will on the basis of how we are being met at that place so what is it going to take uh, I, uh, every minister in this room like myself has, have, has come time and time again to such a place of despondency and despair to say Lord we catch a glimpse of what you're wanting but when we see what is the truth of our present condition whew, I want to abandon ship the only thing that keeps me going is that I know he'll succeed that what he said he will do he will have a church that will be a glory unto his name and somehow because he says it despite where it presently is however despairing and foreboding I go on and we all go on well, and I think a big part of our problem has been we haven't understood what kind of environment will meet our true needs and we've, uh, we, 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 we have an idealism again and a good, kind of good, um, about what will be conducive to our spiritual growth right. and we don't understand the kind of conflict Right. We have not ourselves understood what church is. We have a, a fanciful, romantic notion of what church is, you know, of, of excitement and great speakings and juicy fellowship and so on. We don't think of it as a place of suffering, a place of confrontation, a place of exposure, a place of dealing, a place for sinners being healed and made whole. So if our whole framework of understanding and concept is out of kilter with God's how then can we fulfill this so maybe the very first requirement is to come to a place of definition of what is church in the intention of God himself for what did he give his life and, and, and cast all his confidence in the coming forth of that to meet his own needs and purposes in the earth and to be his eternal bride adorned for the bridegroom without blemish and without spot Let's, let's, let's adjust ourselves in the light of church as he intends it and not what we have institutionally made it to be John we have a bride oh 
Where has the time gone? In sacred, holy things. So precious in your sight that you gave your blood for them. And Lord, your blood itself, however precious a provision, an ultimate provision, is itself made null and void, except on the basis of truth and true confession, or else it does not have the power to cleanse from all unrighteousness. And so we thank you for this reminder this morning. Oh Lord, carry on. Bore us through, penetrate and pierce into our inner man, into the, into the depths of us, my God, corporately and personally, and give us a true apprehension of what is our call? What is the church?